Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah, the okay. The, the um, song actually does have like animal sounds, like the beginning. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for sticking to the music. I know some of the music I play may not be to everyone's taste, and it's definitely more <coughs> to do with the um, the words than the actual. <laughs> Yeah, that's quick. Yeah, true. Um, that has more to do with the words necessarily than the style of music. So that was very good, Adam. So I don't know. Uh, we're beginning a new section, and I can't underlie the importance of this concept that is um, being introduced here. And so it's about to, you know, about to get into some areas in this next in this section too that can be very difficult to think about that some people may not have considered before. And again, the whole premise of the class is not to get you to change your belief system and to think a certain, excuse me, a certain way. It's just to examine beliefs that do exist. These are, these are teachings that exist within traditional Judaism. And they have their basis in understanding from Torah, from the Tanakh. And they come from scripture. So um, again, so we'll be delving into that. Um, before we begin this whole new section, I didn't know if there were any um, questions or comments before we um, we start. Because this is, we'll probably just do a really not trying to get into um, chapter one here, where he just introduces this whole idea, but he starts to expand on the comment, the, the concepts. One moment. So he starts to expand on the concepts that he's introducing in chapter two. So he's giving you this general concept of um, providence, divine providence, and then he expands on those various aspects of divine providence. So, Mr. Um, Hashem, we'll get started. I'm starting on page 91. For those of you who have the same book as I, it's it's section two, chapter one. It's called Providence in General, and it's not just a place in Rhode Island. <laughs> Okay, okay, sorry. No more bad jokes. I'll begin. Um, so here it says, It is evident that everything that exists, both both above and below, was only create, was created only because the highest wisdom deed these phenomena necessary and useful for furthering the purpose of creation as a whole. The natural laws and properties of each created thing were ordained by the highest wisdom to perfectly fit the role that each thing plays in the general scheme. Since each thing was initially created for a purpose, it is appropriate that it be maintained as long as it, as it is serving its purpose. God created all things. He continues to oversee them and maintain them in the state that he desires. And I'll go back to this whole concept that the Ram Khal introduced in the previous section, the idea of determinancy versus indeterminacy, that there's this, there are laws, there are systems, there are rules that govern the universe, the world, and, and nature that we exist in. If you, if you jump from a bridge, you're going to go splat. When you don't, and God intervenes and, and, and bends the rules of nature, that's called a miracle. And Judaism is very clear, don't expect a miracle. Um, because God has his systems in place and this is how the universe works. Now, God, God being the master and the creator of all these systems have the right, has the right at any time to change the rules or bend the rules if he so pleases. But in general, these rules exist and they function pretty predictably. But there is this in, in, in factor in our created world, which is us, and that we can change um, reality in a sense that our actions can interact and change the course of events in human history. One person can change everything in an instant. And we see that, unfortunately, in headlines today. And, and people who have taken and acted on their own free will have changed the courses of entire countries. Um, and so we can see that man has this indeterministic aspect this indeterministic factor that he can change and manipulate reality to the extent provided by God. And the really important concept is everything exists in this world apart from man has and doesn't exist at the same level that we do. We have the power of choice. We are physical. We are spiritual. We have this ability of mobility. Because we can become holy. We become, become profane. We can do works that are good and attach ourselves to God. We can sin and bring the whole world down with us. 
animals, angels, these other created beings exist within a program, a function, and they can't function outside of their role. They don't have the mobility that we do. And again, my favorite movie analogy is The Matrix. There's a point in one of the movies where the main character, who's called Neo, is sitting with this woman who's called the Oracle, and they exist in this computer-generated world called The Matrix. And so she points at different aspects of their world, and she says, there's, there's, you see some birds out eating, and, you know, and they're acting like birds. And she says, those birds exist because there's a computer program making them do that function, making them act. Someone had to program that bird. Someone had to program the bench. Someone had to program the, the world that exists. In, and that is an analogy that can be carried over very, very easily into our world. Everything exists had to be created. It is connected. If the, if the true essence of God is spiritual, then when we exist in a physical world, then at some sense, some, somewhere along the line, all these physical things had to come into being, had to be programmed. And the programming behind that are what we call angels and forces. It's not computer language. It's the spiritual force that's maintaining it. So every blade of grass, every animal, everything that exists, everything we can touch, taste, and feel has a, spiritual, has a connection to the spiritual realm through these, through these forces. And... Um, as long as it's functioning properly, as long as it's um, serving its purpose, it's allowed to exist. But you can see that there are times, and the Torah is very clear, that when Israel acts, this inter indeterministic action called sin and disobedience can affect, the f then can affect the surroundings, can affect the weather and the land and their very, their very items that they possess through this, there's an affliction called Zara, it's a called leprosy in English. They can get it on their clothes. They can get it on their house. So you can see that their, their spiritual actions can affect the physical world. And another, we've talked about it before, is the, um, the idea that, that you can actually contaminate those inanimate objects around you. You can pollute your environment spiritually through your own actions. And you can, you can cause those forces that, that upon which these inanimate objects exist to be polluted and become evil. And we're going to get into that in the next, in chapter two, actually. Um, so we'll continue on in section two. Um, as we have discussed earlier in section 153, the beginnings of all created things are in the transcendental forces. All physical things result from them, and all their details are a consequence of what is reflected to them by these forces, following their own detailed qualities. There is nothing, large or small, in the physical world that does not have its cause and origin among, these, among some aspect of these forces. The one who oversees all these concepts is God himself, and he does so in the same way that he created them. Accordingly, he first oversees the array of transcendental forces and everything that results from their essential nature. He then supervises the angelic agents who are appointed to maintain the existence and function of all that exists, giving them the power to do their tasks. The human race, however, is different from all other species. Since it was given free will and the ability to involve itself with both perfection and deficiency, man is therefore an active, moving influence and it is, and not something that is merely acted upon. So for gold or an item or an animal or the land to be contaminated, it can't, there's nothing, there's nothing a goat can do, there's nothing that gold or the land can do to contaminate itself to, be, to go from a state of holiness or connectivity or, or serving its true purpose to a state of deficiency and actually causing um, what we call evil or unholy. It's the action of man that can cause that. And you see there's a lot of Torah commandments that relate specifically to using the environment and objects and um, how we relate to um, items in our daily life that can that can cause it to um, cease functioning properly to the point where it, it would need to be destroyed. Um, so we'll continue on. And the, the providence dealing with man must therefore also be different from that concerning other species. In the case of man, it must oversee and scrutinize every detail of these of his activities and bring about things that are the result of his ways and fruit of his deeds. Each one of a person's deeds, as well as their results, are scrutinized, and providence is then extended to him in the particular manner that suits their consequences, and the individual is judged 
measure for measure, as will be discussed in a later chapter. This is not true, however, of any other species than man. The members of other species are acted upon, but have no influence themselves. They merely exist to maintain the species as a whole, according to the nature of its spiritual root. Providence is thus merely extended to maintain the root in all of its branches, according to the inherent nature and function of that root. Human beings, on the other hand, act and exert influence as individuals. They therefore require individual providence, and everything must be the result of their deeds, no more and no less. And we will expand upon this further in the following chapters. And there you get into this really deep concept that we talked about, the deterministic influences. Outside of man, the way things function has been set in stone by God. Whether an angel is holy or not, what, what different items, different actions cause in this world outside of man um, are all determined by God. You call it like animal, like a tiger is going to act like a tiger. It's not, you know, it's going to hunt down a gazelle and eat it. Oh, it's not a gazelle, you know, or a lion's going to hunt down a gazelle and eat it because it's a lion. It's not going to look at the gazelle and say, oh, you know, you had a bad day. I'm going to let you go. I'll go find my food elsewhere. No, it's going to hunt. It's going to kill because that's its nature. That's how it's supposed to act. It's its DNA. That's what it is. A tree will beget another tree, and it'll serve the function of a tree because that is what it is. It can't suddenly decide to change its form. Whereas man, in, in this world, we can, we can decide to go from the state of holiness to the state of impurity. We can go from being agents of good to agents of destruction, dependent upon which path we choose, which choice we make. And unlike the lion that will look at the gazelle and eat it if it can, man has this ability to tame his instincts, to, to thwart his energies, to contemplate the universe, to have the intellectual capacity to think about higher things other than our daily necessities if we so choose and as a result of this this is the realm where we have the ability to connect to God you know the lion's not sitting out there thinking about the meaning of his existence and whether he should go hunting today it's his instinct we have the ability to transcend that nature within ourselves because God gave us the capacity because our true nature is to connect with God and the realm that we do that in is really the, the mind and we talked about in this physical world it's really we really are born at a great disadvantage because we have this physical, we have this physicality that separates us from spiritual things. And as a result of this physicality, we have an innate inability to sense spiritual matters. And so we have this, this, um, we have this great conflict. We have this innate desire and need to connect with the creator of the world yet we have all these obstacles put in our way to keep us from doing so easily. And so the reason that these exist these why, and, and how they function and why they're there is this whole system of providence. It's um, Rabbi Arya Kaplan, who is the um, translator of this book, wrote another book called Inner Space, and he uses a lot of the concepts in this book to explain some really deep concepts of um, he uses his own language. We're in the Ram call. He's just doing a translation. What he does is he does a paraphrase of Ram call, and he brings in other analogies to try and explain some of these really deep concepts. And one of the concepts he plays out is he says, if you look at the system of the world, and again, in, as a computer, like in a computer program, there's a general program, there's a general platform that all of these various operations exist upon. Like in for us PC users, it's Windows, and you have you have different programs that function and do different things. You have some that maintain your computer. You have some that help you create Word documents. You have others that you can email, you can chat with. So the basic platform supports all these other possibilities. And so you have computers that can control entire systems in our own world. They control traffic lights to help control um, you know, uh, different functions and operations. So just with this little, this little, I wouldn't say simplistic, but this, this amazing thing called the computer, we can do so many things. And so this is the system that you can best use to um, compare to what providence is. It's this general system through which God has ordained the world will function. It's this deterministic aspect of the world that God has set into place. And the other analogy in regards to interacting with this system that, that Rabbi Kaplan uses in the book Inner Space is the chess game. 
and he does a really good job with the uh, whole analogy of the chess game and its um, and how we interact with God in, at specific points in time. And so he lays out the fact that we will that unlike the animals who can't change, you know, like we talked about the lion is a lion, he's going to act like a lion, he can't suddenly just, you know, become a pacifist, he'd starve and die. The, we have the ability to, ch to change our nature, to uh, transcend the physical world and to delve into the spiritual realms using the power of our higher souls and using the power of our mind, which is the connectivity to the spiritual realm. And, but that being said, we because we're the indeterministic creature, because we have the power to change, God also has to deal with our actions. If we truly have the power of choice, if we really can interact and choose different paths, but God is ultimately in control of the world and ultimately has a plan, then there has to be some sort of interaction that allows us to make a choice, yet at the same time allows God to, to bring about his master plan. And so it's this delicate game. I hate to use the word game because God's not toying with us, but this is the system that he's put into place to allow us to have a path, to have us, allow us to have a real choice. You have the power to do great evil if you choose. And so it's a real legitimate choice. It's, God's not going to stop out of the heavenly realm and stop you. Now, there may be systems and, that come against you, but ultimately you will. And so when you make that choice, you ha you have just triggered a whole set of mechanisms to bring about a whole set of consequences, good or bad, based on your on your on your action. And just like in a chess game, when you move one of your pieces, then your opponent now has to respond to what you've done. And um, I'll give you the analogy before we delve into the next chapter that, that um, Rabbi Kaplan used. He says, you know, there's a grand master. You're playing chess with a grand master, and he ultimately wants you to win. So he is going to play. Now, I want you to know I'm horrible at chess. <laughs> I'm awful. And so if I were playing a grandmaster, he absolutely owns every move. His understanding of chess and all of the different consequences of different moves and different opening positions are, you know, I, I can't even fathom the way that he thinks about chess. So ultimately, the choice to move a piece or not to move a piece, to respond or not respond to a play he makes is mine, but he being the grandmaster can totally manipulate everything on that board to do exactly what he wants. Yes, I am bad. Thank you, Pano. <laughs> and as a result of this ability to manipulate that, I still have a choice. If he puts his queen in front of my rook and I choose not to take the queen, that was my choice. Now he may respond differently in the next play because I didn't do what he anticipated. I did something differently. So he's so that grandmaster of chess is next play to make sure that I get ice is ultimately mine. And so Judaism says the only thing under heaven, it, the only thing that you will ultimately have is your response. Everything's under heaven except the fear of heaven. And I will be right back because Paltok is crashing on me. Sorry about that. Um, so going to the analogy of this chess player, this grandmaster and his innate ability to understand chess at a completely different level than I will ever be able to, has the ability to completely control the board, but that doesn't take away my ability to choose, my ability to play a piece or not play a piece, because the rules of chess say that I have the power to make this move or to make or not make a move. He can't force me. He can force me into where there's really no choice, and that's called checkmate, but ultimately, in this game, if this give and take and this exchange in the game, if he wants me to win, you know, he can manipulate it to be that way. If he wants to thrash me in just five moves, you know, I'm sure it could happen too. So, this is the analogy that, that Arya Kaplan uses in regards to this system, the computer and the computer generated, you know, what, what a computer can accomplish and how a computer functions in this chess game are two analogies that, the, that Arya Kaplan uses and does a very good job with. Um, so, um, does anybody have any questions right now or any comments before we go into Chapter 2 of Section 2? None. Yeah, it's pretty general right now. It hasn't gotten into anything specific. So, um, again, stop me at a point in time if you have questions and please, 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 please ask questions or ask for clarifications or, you know, a question like what did you say and why did you say that? <laughs> Good question. Um, 
Well, yeah, that's exactly true, Bruce. You could. He would know every possibility and be prepared, but that doesn't... But that mean, that just means that there's numerous paths. You can't tell, like, there are numerous paths. Every option, you know, we have these numerous possibilities with what we can do, and they're all, all these possibilities are known. It's just we have the choice to make... Um, Exactly. We have the we have the choice to take one particular path over another. Um, so I'll continue. Oh, go ahead, Olive. Can I be heard, please? Thank you. Um, the question I have is this. Uh, obviously, we have. No problem, Jean Isabel. No problem. I saw you not in the room, so I invited you. I've tried a few times. Anyway, um, this question is uh, obviously we have free will to choose good and good or bad. How does if if one choose to do bad? And, and uh, remember, Isabel, you said our nature is made to do good. And our nature has been made to have this connection with God. So what happened when Adam and Eve sinned, or when mankind sinned, what happened with the nature of... Because when God gave us the nature, it was good in the beginning, before mankind sinned, right? <coughs> so... Uh, if if one does not do good or does good, how does it affect that person's nature? I hope this uh, uh, I hope this question is specific. This is very specific for me. I I hope I uh, was clear. Um, if I if I'm not clear, please uh, just. Okay, thank you. I, it's it's very important. I I love to know if someone does bad since God made our nature our nature good in the beginning, and 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 because we have fallen to sin, our nature has changed. So what does how this good? If I do good to someone else, how does this affect me? Thank you. Okay, sorry. To use the analogy of this chess play again, you have when you make a choice, other choices now become available that weren't before. Um, when you choose to, you know, you choose to move your piece, uh, you know, position your queen in a different place on the chessboard. Now you have plays that weren't available to you that that aren't, you know, before. You have the ability to move your queen elsewhere where you didn't before, and so. When you make a choice, other possibilities become open to you. So when you choose to do good, and, and what is good and what is right, what is the correct way, it has been revealed, and we talked about the revelation is called Hashem, you know, Torah, Scripture, and that is one of the ways that has been revealed to us what good is. So when you fulfill this function of good by making taking an action, possibilities of doing further good, of going even further along the path, it become open to you and so in Judaism it says you know when a person seeks to seeks to do good you know seeks to do a commandment the, the reward of one of doing one commandment is the, is another one meaning that you're allowed to do even more another analogy is if you do a good job with little things then you're going to get to do bigger things hopefully and bigger things um, and the same is true regarding evil when you when you do something evil when you choose to do that disconnect and choose to do an action that is forbidden or to, that causes harm, then you have possibilities now where you didn't have before to fall even further away. That you're allowed to you 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 get to choose the path you're on. And um, <laughs> sorry about that, Luminous. So you get to choose the path you're on, and those possibilities are become even greater and greater. Now, if a person continually chooses to do evil. We talked about this, you know, we have a physical body, but there's a spiritual reality, our spiritual selves, that we have the ability to connect to in a very limited way, but we can still connect to them even in the physical world. When you choose to do evil, and 
then that connection to your spiritual self becomes lessened and weakened to the point where if you continually choose the path of evil, then you can completely cut yourself off from from, um, from God and from your spiritual self as well. And I wouldn't say man was created good. In the Garden of Eden, man was created perfectly balanced, where there was, there was an, a part of evil, just enough deficiency in the Garden to allow um, Adam and Eve to make a choice, but but they were balanced. They were perfectly balanced to do the function that God wanted them to do. And when they fell, when Adam and Eve fell, then that balance, that harmony, that symmetry of their soul and physical body coexisting together was broken. And in this, and what happened is the world was changed, and the reality of their life was changed. And now the physical has a greater um, Greater, greater pull than the spiritual and and their inclination to do evil to to exist in this deficiency to co- to partake of deficiency has been even now has um, almost a greater sway than their ability to connect and to do good so you have a lot of struggle and striving in this world that wasn't a reality for before the fall um, I hope that helps you now there's now we've been talking in general terms about sin, you know, deficiency and and evil and good and 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 um, light. So he's gonna in these next sections he's gonna he's gonna in, introduce how these how these systems take place because we know God ultimately wants us to have a relationship with Him, but He's just and we have all these you know these things that we know to be true from God through what He's revealed to Himself through creation creation through nature, through Torah especially. And so we know that he's good, we know that he's just, we know that he's merciful, we know that he's all of these things. So how did these attributes play out in regards to how we how we interact with our creator? And so um, I'll, I'll read a little bit here in chapter 2. two. Um, so I'll read the first section. Uh, we ha- and on page 95, by the way, if you have the book. We have stated earlier that the purpose of the creation of the human species is that man should become worthy of attaining true good, namely, being drawn close to him in the world to come. Hence, the ultimate end of his in- evolvement is the tranquility of the world to come. The highest wisdom decreed, however, that this would be best attained if man should would first exist in the present world, bound and limited by its natural laws. This is actually the true and proper preparation necessary for the desired goal, and everything in this world is therefore arranged so that it should serve as a means of preparing and readying man for his ultimate purpose. And again, this brings back to the really important point that... Uh, while we are, you know, while we have this world to come, where we are going to, we're going to get to partake of the delights and the rewards and the judgments of what we've accomplished in this world, and that's ultimately where our soul will be able to experience the the work that it's accomplished. We are still physical creatures. We're still required to function in this world, and so the to withdraw from the physical world to totally delve into spiritual realms and to not become involved in physical matters is a total anathema to the reason that you're created. So the greatest good is that you become involved in the physical world in the prescribed way. That there is a proper way to relate to to each other. There's a proper way to relate to the, to the natural world. There's a proper way to relate to God. It's a really dangerous task because we talked about the association of the physical with the spiritual, the spiritual really takes a hit in regards to its ability to influence and function and inter- and, and act upon the physical realm. And so this association in this world, because this world is very deficient, it's a very much a dark course world where God's light is barely able to penetrate in and God's presence is barely is concealed behind this um, clothing that we call nature. That that it's a really it's really dangerous because the the problem is we have this inclination towards the physical. We have the inclination towards this world that is damaging and and can completely annihilate our soul 
to the point where it can be cut off if we choose to delve into the physical world and choose to delve, delve into areas of deficiency. But yet, it, we're, we're required by God to do this. This is this world is holy. It really ultimately is holy because this is the this is the method God gave us to connect with Him and to bring about this repair and this. Ex- and we were born, every one of us, with a job to do. We are born with a function, with a role, with a purpose. And when we fulfill that purpose, then we clean up our own corner of creation. We clean up the mess that Adam and Eve create, created, and we restore it. So ultimately, everything will be restored into its proper place and function, and we will be able to um, to bring the, the world will become, through this, rest, this repair, the the place that it was intended to to be, and there are different functions, different ways to do that. One big one is through fulfilling the commandments of the Torah, um, and fulfilling um, our function in regards to our interaction with nature and with God and with each other. And we also have, and he's going to talk about this in later sections. There's also additional help. One of the one of the greatest ways that there comes restoration repair is through this concept of Moshiach. So, um, I don't know if anybody had any questions or comments as well. I'm going to continue a little bit further. So this preparation involves two aspects: one concerning individuals, and the other humanity as a whole. The preparation of the individual in his attainment of perfection through his deeds, that of humanity as a whole, involves the preparation of the entire human race for the world to come. So we know that God ultimately has a goal. The general goal is good, but there's ultimately... But there's ultimately a goal for humanity, a goal for creation that God is bringing us to how we get there, what path we take to arrive there is dependent upon us, individuals and humanity as a whole. So I'll continue. Man was created with a good urge, his Yitzhah HaTov, an evil urge, the Yitzhah HaRa, and free will. This allows the human race to include some individuals who are good as well as others who are evil. Ultimately, the evil ones must be cast aside and the good ones gathered to form one perfected community. It is for this community that the future world and all its attained good are intended. So we talked about the the problem of the spiritual world is when something is close spiritually, it has to be similar. The more similarities that that are shared between two entities in the spiritual realm, the closer they are. In so two opposites cannot be brought together in the in the spiritual world by the very essence of how the spiritual world functions. But in our physical world, closeness is not is not similarity; it's space. So when you're close to somebody, you, you're physically close. Now we also exist in this realm we talked about, where because we are spiritual beings and we have this other dimension to our reality, where we have we have this concept of emotional closeness. You can be sitting next to somebody and be distant. How? Because you're you're not connected. You're not um, close in the spiritual sense. So, but in this world, because of this, we have the ability to have these two opposites brought together. Things that are in exact opposite can be joined together in this world, and that is that is done through these inclinations towards good and inclinations towards evil. They're polar opposites. They're, they're pulling opposite directions. So in the spiritual realm, they cannot coexist. But within us, in the physical world, they can. But that causes a problem because we're now at war with ourselves constantly because these are integrated into our being. And so we have a constant conflict, a constant battle going on with every choice we make. Then it's not always some dramatic thing. It's not always it's not always life or death. It may be small things, but it's you know it's literally every choice we make can be served to f- can be used to serve God and draw us closer, or it can be used to draw us away. And it's and how that happens is dependent upon a lot of influences. But based on these understandings of God being just and true, without deficiency. He says that there are there are people who are evil, and because of the nature of God, they have to be judged and cast aside because the ultimate 
the ultimate goal of God is this perfected community. So everything that is being done in this world, every action, every influence is is to the goal of bringing about this reality of this perfected community. And so God's interaction with this world and with human race is this ultimate goal. Like we talked about the grand master whose ultimate goal is he wants you to win. Everything that is done is for this purpose. So the fact that we have choice, the fact that the world is there is there is darkness and God's light is dependent upon our actions and there's there's natural laws that govern us and we have the ability to function the way we do is all set about by God for his purpose, his goal. So I'm going to continue reading on. If we're on I'm starting on page 97 now, 2 in section 2, um, to man in this world. No. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit further. And if, again, if you have questions at any point, please. It is this principle of free will that assures the possibility of good and evil in the human race, allowing some of its members to be good and others to be evil. This same principle, moreover, has the same consequence with respect to the deeds of each individual. Although a person's deeds may be either all good or all evil, it is also possible that some be good and others evil. So just like two, despair, two polar opposite natures can exist in one creature, the Yitzhar Hara, the Yitzhar Tov, the inclination to good, inclination towards evil, can exist in one person. So can the deeds that they bring about. You can be a mixture. Now in the physical, in the physical world that's possible, in the spiritual realm that's not possible. But that's our reality. So it is why, well, we talked about the whole idea of the bell curve. That there's, there are people, there are people that are wholly good, and there are people that are wholly evil. But most of us exist on the spectrum of a mixture of good or evil. We fall somewhere on this, on this curve when you plot it out. And so, that's there's a problem. There's a real problem there, and he'll figure, he'll he'll bring in the problem. Says, this very fact, however, could have the power to prevent the existence of the perfected community that we have mentioned. Elements of both good and evil can exist in a single individual, and if only some were considered and not others, man's judgment would not be righteous. This would be true even if the ones taken into account were formed, formed the majority. Proper judgment would require that all of man's deeds be judged, great and small alike, and they constitute whether they constitute the majority or the minority. The highest wisdom therefore decreed that man's recompense be divided into two periods and places with regards to reward as well as punishment. All of a person's deeds are divided into two groups, that of the majority and that of the minority. After the majority and the minority are determined the majority are judged by themselves in the proper place and time. The same is true of the minority of one's deeds. Now the true main reward is in the world to come. As we noted, this everlasting recompense of the worthy individual is a bond of closeness with him forever, whereas the punishment is being thrust away from this true good and perishing. Um, so this is the problem that, that if if God were to overlook the evil that we do, because we know He ultimately wants good for us, He ultimately wants this connection to us, He ultimately wants us to connect to Him, if He were to overlook the evil that we've done, the deficiency that we've caused in this world, then that would be, that would violate certain principles of the, I guess the structure upon which the universe is built. One of them is justice. We know that God is just and good and no deficiency exists in him. So for God to overlook deficiency in us would violate that principle. So as a result, we know that we're going to be judged completely for what we've done. And as a result of us, most of us being a mixture of good and evil, then we are going to have actions that fall into one category or the other. We ultimately know that the true reward is not this world, that the pleasures and delights that this world offers, or the pain and the sorrow that this world offers is is insignificant compared to the world to come. And so we have this dilemma that we know, being a mixture of good and evil, when, if, when we go to the physical 
when we when we go to the world to come, which is a greater level of of spiritual reality, that in the spiritual realm, that this these opposites can't exist together. We, they can't exist by the very fact that we are a mixture, we are unworthy, we are unfit, we are unable to exist in the spiritual realm in the olam haba. So this dilemma has to be has to be dealt with before we can enter into the spiritual realm. And so the system of how these this this dilemma is corrected in this world and in the spiritual world is what he's going to be talking about next. So he's he's pointed out a really big problem for us as individuals who may not be wholly righteous and may not be wholly um, wicked either. So um, he's just put us in a precarious position, but he said God's God's in control. So so um, the. I'll I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Now, the true main reward is in the world to come, as we have noted. Um, the everlasting recompense of the worthy individual is a bond of closeness with him forever, whereas the punishment is being thrust away from the true good and perishing. And that the bond of closeness in that spiritual realm, meaning that we're similar to our Creator, that that closeness spiritually is through similarity. So this judgment was set up, however, to be in accordance with the majority of one's deeds. The good deeds of the wicked and evil deeds of the righteous, which constitute a minority, are dealt with in this world through its gratifications and sufferings. It is in this world that the wicked are rewarded with prosperity for their few virtues, while the righteous are punished with suffering for their few faults. In the end, Hashem compens- com- I'm sorry, compensates every deed, and whether and whatever compensation remains to be given in the next world is that which is for fitting for the next world's perfection. That is, the next world is only for the righteous and the wicked are totally absent. And again, there's this disparity. If you cannot you cannot be close to Hashem. You cannot be existent in the spiritual realm in this Olam Abba, in this world to come with deficiency within you. It has to be dealt with. There has to be a balance of judgment. You have to come into this perfectly balanced state that Adam and Eve existed in the garden and most of us are not there. So there are systems in place to get us to the state that we need to when we arrive in the, at that at that place of judgment in the Lam Haba, in the spiritual realm. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> should I should I um, make it some kind of difference when I'm reading and talking? And so um, as a result of this, there are various systems set up. So to for those people who are mostly wicked, who have caused a great deal of deficiency, but they have done some good, their good is rewarded in this world. And the same is true for those for those righteous individuals who have done some who have done some evil, who have caused some deficiency to exist as a result of their actions. And so that is also dealt with. So when they stand before God, the balance the, the price has been paid, so to speak. And the and the mechanism, the vehicle through which these issues of deficiency are dealt with and reward are dealt with are punishment and, and, and reward. These are, these are the vehicles God uses to even out the balance of our, of our being, of our nature, if that. Well, Adam, Adam and, and Eve were, were not totally perfected, that they were, there was some deficiency that existed in the um, Garden of Eden. There was enough deficiency to exist that exists at that time to allow them the possibility of a choice. Um, so as a result of that, there was deficiency, but not at all. It wasn't integrated into their being. It was it was this perfect symmetry to allow for choice, um, but only to the only to the extent only that which was minimally necessary to give them a choice. And so, yes, there will be different levels of Alam Haba because we all stand at different points of deficiency versus light within our own soul. And we won't enter, I'm sorry, if I did give you the idea that we will enter the same level as Adam and Eve, that was, that was not correct. That we will be dealt with in this world and through different systems of judgment and um, punishment and reward to arrive at this, the, the, the state, the best state possible for us to be in, and not everyone will be at the same level, because not everyone will have achieved the same things, and not everyone will have tried to perfect themselves at the same level as others have. 
it's not it's not always who's living the holiest life and who's doing the most stuff. Sometimes you can have the most wicked soul that does just the that completely transcends its nature and does a good deed that can that can cause an even greater repair than somebody who was born completely righteous and does good deeds. It's there, you know. Just like we have um I always say I'm going to be the, the one who picks the gum off the sidewalk. But the saying is that, you know, every everybody is is spiritually, just like you're genetically different and you're spiritually different as well. There are some people who have a greater inclination, a greater a greater, greater pull of the Yitzhahara in this world than others. And so when they're able and when they have a greater pull towards towards evil, and King David is one, one primary example of that, then when they transcend this, this, um, this, pull and actually do good and it's 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 amazing it's um it's an, it's it's almost a miraculous at times for some people when they do that versus others but we all we will not all be at the same level and we'll get into that um my apologies for giving that impression um continue so now the true okay we talked about this so we talked about the majority and the minority, um, and in the, the wicked cannot exist in this realm by the very nature of what the spiritual realm is. Um, furthermore, the righteous are free there of any obstacle within themselves that might restrict the delight intended for them. The wicked, on the other hand, are cast aside and annihilated, and they have no cause to complain since they have already been rewarded for their fir- few virtues in this present world. And so... Just like in the Garden of Eden, the physical, the physical reality of Adam and Eve was not meant to trap their souls. It was meant to be a vessel to allow their souls to radiate, to allow these spiritual and physical to integrate to the, to the point where the physical was nothing but a vehicle for the spiritual self to fulfill its function in the physical realm. And as a result of these, these our deeds in this world, then the soul will become strengthened, will radiate, and and the proper relationship will be restored, and we'll get to we'll get to experience the true delight, the true reality of our of our of our striving, of our work, because the rewards in this world are not the true rewards that God has prepared for us. Yeah, and there's the other one is um, what do they call it? The the um. Energy is just changing form there. It's, yeah. Um, so, any questions or comments before we continue on the next one? Because he's he's gonna he's gonna bring, narrow down his point. He's gonna bring it down because right now it's pretty harsh. You got you bad. You got good. And you know the evil are gonna be annihilated, and the people who have a little bit of bad are gonna be dealt with. But then you have to say, what about the people in the middle? So okay, okay, Olive, go ahead. Okay, you you are um, okay. Sorry, sorry. You were speaking about um, deficiency. This uh, I noticed that it's been used uh, very often in this book, right? Deficiency and also um, you speak about. Um, uh, going back and to repair the word repair, the repair and the deficiency. These two are um, on the country. Is it possible? Can you elaborate what you mean repairing what? I I, I think I I do understand, but I just want to understand a little bit more depth. Um, and and what is this deficiency? Thank you. And repair. Thank you. This is um, a difficult question to answer in that it's simplistic, but it isn't. (laughs) Um, Deficiency is anything that obscures God's light in this world. As a result of this hiding of God's light, then um, greater darkness exists, and as a result, evil 
is strengthened. The analogy is the that I can best use is at the beginning of the world, at creation of the Garden of Eden, everything was in a perfect balance. The amount of deficiency that existed allowed only for the, possi only for the possibility of a choice. It wasn't the essence and in, in integrated into the physical nature of Adam and Eve. Their physical self was nothing but a vehicle of the soul. When Adam and Eve sinned, this physical shell, almost, it was almost like they, they, were, they fell asleep and woke up in cement. They were, they're trapped. Their soul is trapped in, in, this, in, in this vessel, in this husk, in the shell that absolutely smothers it. And at the beginning, we talked about how everything is connected spiritually, that, and nothing in this world exists without some kind of connect, connectivity through, the, to, through angels, to the forces, to ultimately to God. There's an the idea that everything has an innate spiritual energy within it. If it didn't, then it wouldn't exist. That energy, you can call it an angel, you can call it a force, but it's there. With the physicality of the world that, it, that was a result of Adam and Eve's fall, a lot of these physical, these spiritual energies were hidden, were almost, to use the analogy, like the physical shell, they became, they be, like this shell, which was supposed to radiate the spiritual beauty of everything, became like a shell that trapped it. So as a result of this, when we, when we talk about deficiency, we talk about repair, we talk about like cleaning the windshield, like Bruce said a long time ago, you know, basically like, you know, it's um spiritual draino that you open these channels back up so God's light can get back in. How do you do that? Through your actions. Through your... Um, through your responses and how you deal with the physical world. So when you choose to emulate God, when you choose to be like God, then you are fulfilling the function of yourself and the universe and you are actually becoming a conduit for God's light, a channel for God's presence in this world through your own actions. So when you choose to be patient, we know that God, you know, the attributes of mercy that God put in Exodus you know, God is patient, He's kind, He's loving, you know, He's 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 long suffering. When you and you emulate these these attributes of God, this is the these are the attributes that God put into creation. So you're fulfilling you're 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 elevating creation by uncovering its true essence because everything's been splattered with mud, it's been hidden, it's been buried under the ash of sin and deficiency. So when you do these actions, you're literally uncovering the the, the beauty and the essence of of the world and the true essence of nature and creation in yourself and around you. When you use food or um, an item in a holy way to connect to God, you're taking the spiritual essence that is functioning behind that and you're bringing it and um, channeling it and using it in its proper proper way, you're bringing it back into spiritual alignment. It's functioning properly. It's like a feedback system. What you put in, you get out. Um, I don't know if that helps answer the questions. So this idea of tikkun, of this repair, is battling. Is literally, it's like a spiritual war against the 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 ever spreading contamination of sin and deficiency that spreads in this world. It's freeing these I, the spiritual energy to act in a positive way because these items can't change their state by themselves. Their holiness or their deficiency or their unholiness is dependent upon our actions in this world. Um, and so um, when, you, you, when you become a conduit of channeling God's attributes, into this world by your functioning in the way that you were intended, then you bring about a greater amount of God's light in this world, and you can, um, it's the whole analogy of the boat. You can drill a hole under your own seat, but everyone will sink. If you help bail out the water, then everyone will rise, and that's, that's where we are. We're, we are headed towards a goal. Now, what shape we rive in there, rive in when we, when we get there, will be dependent upon your own self and, and humanity as a whole. So, I don't know if that's you at all. Um, 
continuing on. Um, we talked about the wicked being cast aside and annihilated because we know that in the spiritual essence that this this polar opposite of God's true nature can't exist in the spiritual realm. So continuing on in section 4. In his mercy, God maximized man's chances of successfully attaining his ultimate goal. He therefore decreed that there should be another type of purification for those who could benefit from it. This was intended for those who have been surmounted by evil, but not to such a great extent that they should be utterly annihilated. This purification includes a number of spiritual punishments, the most prominent that of being Gehenna purgatory. The purpose of these punishments is to penalize the individual for his sins in such a way that he is subsequently free of any liability for the evil that he may have done. As a result, he can then receive the true reward for his good deeds. Because of this, the number of people who are actually annihilated is small and insignificant. It only consists of those who are dominated by evil so completely that it is utterly impossible for them to have any chance of experiencing the true reward and everlasting delight. This might be a hard thing for a lot of people to take, um, but we're going to go, just drawing you back to some of the really important um, principles upon which God created the universe. And the ultimate one being that he bestowed the greatest amount of good possible upon his creation. And his the ultimate purpose of creation is us. So we know that God's ultimate purpose is to bestow good upon us. Now the concept of sin is very important and I wish he would get into it a little bit deeper here, but he doesn't. The idea is that you have you we have these opposites that exist within one being. We have this deep compulsion to sin. Not um and also this compulsion to connect to our creator to do good, to emulate God and doing that through the inclination to do good. That being said, a lot of times sin is Sin is, I guess you could say, absolute insanity. Anybody who, if you really, if you really have a grasp of what the world is about, then any sin that you commit is insanity, because you'd have to be insane to absolutely violate the essence of your being and the reason that you exist. So, when a person sins, for the most of us, for most of us, it's not done out of outright rebelliousness against God. It's impulsive. Even if you put some thought into it, it's it's impulsive. It's absolutely impulsive manifestation of, of what exists within you, and that is your, your yetzer hara, your inclination to do sin. Because in this world, that powerful draw exists. It's reality. It's there. You know, David is a good example of that. Again, he he plotted, he plotted the murder of a man. He didn't just do it in a heartbeat. He didn't throw him in front of the, uh, you know, the charging battalion. He plotted his this man's murder. But he he wasn't doing this out of rebelliousness to God. He was doing it. He was exhibiting attributes that existed within him, which is his inclination to to follow those desires, those animalistic instincts. He wanted something. He was going to get it. Now he didn't do this to rebel against God. He didn't do it to thumb his nose at God. He didn't do it to make war against God. He did it because he was. This was his compulsion. He, he. This was a moment of insanity for him. And so, most of the sin that people commit is this kind of insanity. You may think about it, but it's not. You're not doing it because you're outright rebelling against God. Now look at the Tower of Babel. They set out. They sin. They set out to make war against God. There are people that sin rebelliousness. There's um. I'm trying to remember her name now, Cosby. When they, when Israel was there in the camp, they, 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 they were fornicating right in front of the, right in front of the tabernacle because they wanted people to see. They were thumbing their nose at God. That's rebellious sin. Most of the sin that people commit is not that that I despise God. I'm, I'm like, I want to, I want to make, I want to provoke God. It's, it's, it's following your inclination towards evil. It's this impulsiveness. It's living like an animal, basically. It's it's slipping down into this animal realm. And, and it may take, you may put thought into it. You may consider it. You may grapple with it and still do it anyway. You may know what you're doing is wrong, but you're still doing it. You may even think about how wrong it is when you're in the middle of it. That's insanity. And so 
when you say that most of the people, and I'll let you get in a moment, Olive, that most of the people are judged based on this understanding because we exist with these really strong compulsions in this world, and we exist at a really great disadvantage of of being in the physical realm, being disassociated from our spiritual self, being in, unable at most times in our life to perceive the spiritual reality and the damage that our actions are causing in the spiritual realm to ourselves and to the world around us. So that is, God knows that because he made it. He made that existence and we know that God loves us and that is why he wants, he takes that into account when he judges us as individuals. And so we are not to be animals. We are made... We have animal natures, but we are made to transcend that. When we don't, when we act like animals, then we're judged accordingly. But like I said, most of the sin, and if you look in the Torah, most of the words used for sin is not this rebellious sin against God. It is actually living out your animalistic instincts that exist within you. So I'll let Olive go. Thanks, Isabel. Um, well... <clears throat> Uh, you just brought uh, a good point that I never really... I have been thinking about it, but I really cannot understand it. As we know, David really sinned, and God really considered his action sin. Um, however, he repented and God forgave him. And uh, we all know God called God called David. Uh, he's a man after uh, of his own heart. But um, for some reason, although he was also, uh, he he was a sinner, he sinned. There is a difference between him and between, let's say, um, who should I use? Uh, um, uh, Pharaoh. Pharaoh is that a good is that a good um, uh, example between him or between someone uh, uh, that who wants to literally provoke God, God? So isn't that both sin and and I, I, if it is both sin, we all we all know. But what's the difference between the two? And um, uh, when you provoke God intentionally and you want to just disobey no matter what and no repentance um, is it's not the same sin as David for example sin what's the difference be between these two is, there, is it is it clear is, there, is it clear I, I really want to understand uh, two people, let's say uh, King David, sinned. He literally planned to kill the husband of uh, uh, Bathsheba, right? And uh, God has sent him Nathan, and he he, he said that he's a sinner. He sinned literally. So what's the difference between however God forgive him because he asked for repentance truly? It is not off the topic. Actually, it is about the topic because uh, Isabel was just speaking about someone who is literally uh, uh, goes and wants to provoke God and, and wants to sin and also... He, uh, someone like King David that he didn't want to really but he didn't he sinned anyway what's the difference between someone who provoke and who's someone who doesn't provoke um, well getting back to the analogy of the chessboard one of the things that the word there's two things one how God deals with we talked about the individual is important to God but also, at the same time, God deals with humanity as a whole. And so, the Torah specifically states a few places, and I'll get that for you in a moment. I have a, At the end of the class, I have a quote. But God specifically deals with the hearts of kings and rulers very differently than he does the individual, because they're the ones who have the reins of, of these nations that can they literally change history. And so you see God intervenes on behalf of Pharaoh, where Pharaoh was rebellious against God. He, had, he was confronted when he... 
The difference between Pharaoh and David is when King David was confronted with his sin and, and, and a choice, he made the correct choice. He did teshuva. He did a very powerful repentance. Then the same is the same cannot be said regarding Pharaoh. And in fact, he makes these choices. But the Torah also says that he, God hardened his heart. Um, and as a result of these these actions, you have different consequences coming about. And so you can see different systems in place. And getting back to the general idea of punishment and sin, um, the consequences of your actions have to be dealt with. And David paid a huge price in this world for his his sin, um, and his and he you know the son, ultimately his son died from that um, improper union, and so he paid a great price for that. Um, the idea of God being good, wanting the maximum number of people to benefit from the good that he's created for us, he's put various systems into place. And one of the ideas is that we know that wicked individuals cannot be dealt with, cannot enter the world to come. They're annihilated. And that most, that, that those people whose deeds are majority, almost all good, and have a little bit of deficiency or sin, that's dealt with in this world. But most of us aren't at those that either end. Most of us fall somewhere in the middle. And so one of the mechanisms to deal with the sin, that the deficiency, is purgatory, Gehenna. It's, base, it's like a spiritual washing machine to get us in the proper state so we can enter the Olam Haba. God forbid <laughs> that we don't deal with our sins here. The, there's the analogy that using Gehenna is um, fire and it's not literal fire because this is a spiritual world. There's not fire as we would think of it here. The fire of the Olam Haba, I mean, I'm sorry, of the of Gehenna is equated to the shame that one feels when you really, um, you really uh, see the consequences of your own sin without any any place to hide, and that is the first. That's the first thing that Adam and Eve feel when they're confronted by God is their shame. They try to hide themselves. They 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 see their deficiency for the first time and they're ashamed of it. Um, and this is when you really when you really contemplate the ramifications of what Gehenna means. It's a really frightening thing because you experience everything that you brought about in this world when you're judged by Hashem. He peels back. Nature is no longer, there's no physicality, there's no nature, there's no excuses to hide behind. Think about the worst you've ever felt, the most anguish. You, it, it's, it's mental anguish, and there's no escaping it. It's um, If you cause somebody pain, you have no idea when how many other people you have affected by hurting one person. You don't know that the slight that you made against somebody else could have affected chain of people you'll never know well you will know because God will show you and that's what Gehenna is about you you experience the what you've caused in this world without any without any filter that you get to experience everything every nuance of your of of every action that you've created and there's no explaining away your actions everything is 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 revealed under God's light and it's a painful process for the soul a painful process for us to go through, but it's necessary to reach Alam Haba. This is the way that the deficiency is dealt with. We're put through the spiritual washing machine, and just like it's not a very pleasant experience for a sweater, it won't be experienced in a pleasant way for us. And so that's the purpose of purgatory. It's not punishment. It's preparation for the next realm. God doesn't want to... God, this is the other thing. God doesn't meter out... To the, um, judgments in this world because he's cruel and he's wicked and he wants to hit the smite button and he wants to see us suffer and he wants to see us squirm. Suffering has a real purpose. Um, it's to it's to deal with our issues, to bring us to the point of teshuva, to bring us to a point of spiritual purification and balance so we can ultimately experience um, God's greatest good. Troy, the the premise of the class is not to that you have to believe these things. It's it's just to delve into these subjects. Um, this this teaching exists within the realm of Judaism. Whether you choose to believe it or not is absolutely not the point of the class. It's not to convince you that purgatory is right and correct and you have to believe in it. It's to understand that it is a concept that is taught and to understand it as best we can in the context in which it is taught. So, um, 
so the other thing is God really does want the maximum number of people to enter into Alam Haba because most of us, again, we don't sin out of outright rebelliousness against God. We sin because we have a nature to sin. And when we and when we do that, we're, we're basically following the lead of the wrong of the wrong guide, which is our Yitahara. And if you turn, to, I don't have my homash, but if you look at the beginning where Cain is contemplating the murder of his brother, um, Hashem says to him, you know, sin is crouching at the door, but you have the power to overcome it if you choose. Not that it's going to be easy, not that it won't be difficult, but that you do ultimately have the power to make the choice. The choice is in your hands. Whether you choose what, what path you choose, there are many possibilities. There are many paths that you can take at any part in your life. What path you choose to take at that particular time will have real lasting consequences for you. Um, so we therefore see that man's judgment, I'm reading again, I'm sorry. We therefore see that man's judgment is divided into three stages. His main judgment is in the future world that will exist after the resurrection as discussed earlier. There are also deeds that are judged before this, however, and of these, some are recompensed in this world and others in the soul world. The details of man's judgment, however, are not known to anyone other than God who is the true judge. He is the only one who knows the true nature and results of all deeds on every level and in each detail. He therefore knows which should be recompensed in each particular period and manner. Again, going back to what Bruce said about the chess game, you know, God, you know, it's like the grand master. When you move your piece in a certain way, if he's really a good, if he's really a grand master, he really, he'll know, you know, the, all the possibilities that exist based on that one move. You've just changed the nature of the game. All of these certain pathways and moves, you can do this, you can do that, you can do this, and that'll cause other things to happen. And the same is true. Every nuance, every possibility, every path is known to God. God's not surprised. Oh, I didn't expect that. But which path you choose to take is ultimately in your choice. Oh, shalom, Luminous. Thank you for coming. Um, so ultimately, we have the ability to choose the pathway. All the pathways are known to God. It's us that is taking, uh, making that choice. And so we have... The three stages of judgment. In this world, God deals with sin in a limited way. Um, we have the idea of a judgment at the soul world. And then in the in the world to come, when we enter this future world, like um, BC talk, talked about before, not everyone's going to be at the same level. So there's a judgment there as well. You'll make it into Alam Haba. But what level you will be at when you make it there is dependent on your actions in, these, in this world. We'll not all be equal. Because we all didn't do the same thing in this world. We all didn't have, we all have our own challenges, we all have our own um, qualities and nature, and, and some of us try a lot harder than others <laughs> with different results. Um, so I'll continue reading just a bit. I'm not sure what time it is. Okay, plenty of time. Um, also, just going back to the idea that this ultimately is orchestrated by God, whereas the angels and the physical, or the natural world exist on this um, deterministic level, meaning that God doesn't intervene at every nuance. Whereas we have, just like when you make a move in a chess game, now your opponent has to change their their moves based upon what you did. This is the idea of God responding to us in this uh, area of providence. That when we make a move, God makes. When we finally make the path to choose the path, then, then, then God responds to us in, in our choice that we made. Um, and so he's the, and he'll orchestrate everything for us based upon who we are as individuals and our nature and our, and our, and our surroundings and our spiritual makeup and our genetic makeup and our own challenges. So God, God, tweaks every nuance of our life depending on how we're acting at this particular time to bring about a specific goal for us as individuals and humanity as a whole. Um, all that we have that I'm sorry, read again. All that we therefore know is the general nature and basis of this process. We know that it ultimately revolves around one basic principle, namely the assembling of a perfected community fit to exist in the eternal state of intimacy with God. In order for this community to be appropriately perfected, all these provisions are necessary to prepare and ready this ultimate situation. So ultimately, we'll have to 
become similar to our Creator if we're going to exist in spiritual closeness to God in the world to come. So all of these systems are in place to get us to that point. Looking into this more deeply, we see that besides the fact that this is required by fairness and justice, it is also based on the essential concept of man. We have already discussed how good deeds incorporate an intrinsic quality of perfection and excellence into a man's body and soul. Evil deeds, on the other hand, incorporate in him a quality of insensitivity and deficiency, all with the precise measure depending on the deeds, no more and no less. And you'll look that sin is not all equal. Certain sins cause a great amount of harm and deficiency and... Um, than others, there are different levels of sin. You can see that very clearly because they're they're dealt with differently by God in the Torah, and in, and the same is true about um, our good deeds. Our, some good deeds have bring about an enormous amount of light, and others bring in a little bit of light. It's not so much the action all the time as it is the individual bringing the deed in. You have somebody who is sunk to the lowest levels of sin that does teshuva. He's just opened up the floodgates of God for God's light. There's a possibility for God to um, God's light to enter the world through an individual that was, you know, there wasn't one before. So teshuva is really strong. It's a really strong action in this world, and it brings about immense amount of good. And so do the actions of of individuals as well. But um. So these evil, these deeds become part, basically your spiritual essence, that your spiritual ears, your ability to perceive God, to connect to God, is, is affected negatively or positively based upon your own actions. So your spiritual standing, your closeness to God is based upon your own actions, the own state, the choices that you've made. I'll continue reading a little bit. The righteous man may attain in himself a large measure of brilliance and excellence. Yet, on the other hand, because of the minority of evil deeds that he has done, there is in him a mixture of darkness and repugnance. As long as he still has this admixture, he is neither prepared nor suited to become drawn close to God. The highest mercy therefore decreed that some sort of purification exists. This is the general category of suffering. God gave suffering the power to dispel the insensitivity in man, allowing him to become pure and clear, prepared for the ultimate good in its appointed time. The amount of suffering needed to purify the individual would then depend on the amount of insensitivity that he has acquired as a result of, the, of his deeds. In many cases, it is possible that physical suffering alone would not have the power to dispel this sensitivity, and in such cases, Spiritual purification in the soul world is also necessary. The details involved in this are so numerous that the particulars are beyond the grasp of the human intellect. Why is evil necessary? Yeah, it's the, it's the evil. Defi evil is in its essence deficiency. It's the something that holds back God's presence, God's light in this world. And as a result of this holding back, then we're given the realm of choice. If God's light completely, if there was only good in this world, if God's light completely overwhelmed creation, then we wouldn't have choice. If we can't, there can, there's no possibility of good if evil doesn't exist. And so, evil exists to allow for the choice. And evil existed in the garden. There was a natal, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was deficiency in the garden. They had a choice. And so, you know, albeit it was a very limited amount of evil, just enough to allow them for a choice, but it did exist. If they had overcome that, then um, it would have been very differently. I mean, we would be in a very different state than we are now. And so we have this, we are required to do to do good, to, to shun evil, to do good, to turn towards God and away from our own propensity to do, to bring about deficiency. Um, and so God's saying that most of us most of the suffering in the world that comes to people, most people aren't at the level of, they don't, most people aren't at the level of having such an overwhelming majority of good deeds in the world that, that all of their evil, all of their deficiency, all of their sin can be dealt with in the physical suffering. Most individuals are really this mixture, and as a result, then 
suffering in this world alone is not enough to deal with their sin and their deficiency. And But that being said, one of the mechanisms, one of the ways that deficiency is cleaned, is purified in this world is through this concept of suffering. And suffering is can come through physical suffering like like physical illness or that type of thing. But there's also suffering in the Torah, um, restriction, being restricted. One of the one of the people who suffered the most was the high priest. Um, he he could he he was limited who he could marry. He couldn't bury a relative if they died. He was severely restricted in every activity. How he when he cut his hair, what clothing he wore, what he did on a particular day. He really did suffer. He he suffered all these limitations on a daily basis to serve God in a particular function, in a particular way. And so this is another idea of suffering is not always um it's not always what you consider like, you know, physical illness or physical ailment or taking a beating or that type of thing. Sometimes it's just the restrictions that are placed upon our lives. Some restrictions people have that they are born, you know, they have a handicap or they have a deficiency that they can't they can't change. So this is a restriction, this is a suffering that they're that's imposed upon them. And it has a purpose, it has a function, it has a role ultimately in God's plan. And then Ram Call is saying here, it's like there's so many different nuances and God is always balancing every aspect of our life, constantly reprogramming the reality of our world to to make it so we have ultimately we have um the, the greatest good possible for us. And God doesn't do evil. There's no deficiency that exists in God. Here's, that's, that's, um, that is not the case. God is not evil. He does not make evil. Evil is a consequence of his holding back, of his not overwhelming us, not over completely um, disintegrating our choice and our, and our essence of, of perception by overwhelming us with his light. If you're in the middle of the bright, bright sun and you turn on a light, what's the point? If you, you hold up the lantern, what's the point? There's no difference. You're not adding more light. So the point is when there is some kind of deficiency, when some kind of darkness, then we have the possibility for light. So evil is a consequence It's uh, of, of an action, and that is the power to... Um, make a choice and have the ability to connect with God. Um, so he's saying the wrong most of us are not at the state where we would benefit from physical suffering, that if he were to impose all the physical suffering necessary to deal with our deficiency, then we wouldn't make it. <laughs> you see, that gets to the point, the level of dealing with... Um, in, in Amos there, it's the idea that God directs nations nations differently than individuals. And he deals with groups of individuals differently, and there's a providence that exists over, over nations, over peoples, that doesn't exist over individuals. And so, um, in the, in Pharaoh is the primary example of this, where it says numerous times, you know, God, you know, here Moshe and Aaron come with the decree, and God, God hardens his heart, so he won't do it. God intervenes differently at the level of nations and peoples than he does in the individual. And that's a really important concept. And it's in inner space. I'll read it for you. Um, and as for the Lamentations verse, the understanding that you, know, um, you get out of there is there is, and God does act, I would say, in, in, towards what we call evil in that he's justice. He demands he's a just God, and he has to take both good and evil in individuals as um, as a whole. People can't you just your good deeds cannot be separated. You are you are whole. You are you are the totality of your actions in this world, both good and bad. For God to turn and I turn aside and to ignore the evil and deficiency within you would violate the principle that He is holy, just, and good. There is no deficiency that exists in Him. Um, and so, in dealing with these, the the sin and the deficiency that exists within an individual, then certain decrees, certain judgments come out in the individual, towards the individual, from the hand of God to bring them to the place where they have to be. So, um, if I hope that.
answer to that. I, it's it's um, and he's saying it's like this is this is like outside of our being. We can only discuss these things in a very very limited way. And um, I think I'm trying to remember the midrash where it came from, but that you know they talked about the reward of this great Torah teacher. What was his reward? His reward was to be um, tortured by the Romans and martyred in front of his people. And that was the reward for his good deeds. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Why would God do that? He knows, and it brought about an ultimate amount of good. But in regards to individuals and the circumstances that exist in our own lives, you really have to, there's the there's the betochen, the, the, the tr that active trust that God is ultimately working for our greatest good if we're constantly turning towards Him. Yeah, Kiva. Um, let's see here. Um, and continuing on on page 101 in section 6. There are still some people, however, who are absolutely wicked as a result of their deeds and have incorporated in themselves such a great darkness and insensitivity that their bodies and souls are actually corrupted. And you can see this as an example when Israel went in to conquer different nations in the land. When um, God, there were some people, you know, you can take the animals and the gold, but you can't take the people, or you can take the people, some of the people. And so you see levels of pollution and corruption existing in these different, in different places and different populations. And so as a result, some of them are so totally corrupted that they had just completely um, violated the spiritual and sources of existence to this point. There was no way to redeem anything that it all had to be destroyed. So he's saying there are some people that are absolutely, totally corrupted their souls. And they're unfit, therefore, to draw close to God in any manner whatsoever. It is possible, nevertheless, that even such people should have some good deeds. When placed on God's honest balance, however, these deeds cannot bring the individual to the side of true good, neither by virtue of their quality or quantity. If his deeds could go, could so balance him, then this individual would not be considered absolutely wicked, but would be counted among those who are continually purified until they reach a state suitable for the ultimate good. Still, if these good deeds were totally unrewarded, the attribute of justice would be flawed. It would therefore be decreased so that these good deeds be rewarded. Okay, sorry. It was therefore decreed that these good deeds be rewarded in this world, as discussed earlier. Their merit is therefore used up. It doesn't have any effect in incorporating true excellence in such an individual. And so we get back to this really important point of um, God has to, God looks at the individuals in totality. Even these ultimately wicked individuals may have done some good deed. Now, not good enough, you know, to to bring any spiritual good, but it was still a good deed. And so God pays them back. So there's absolutely no balance remaining when he, they stand before God in judgment. And um, and so the attribute of justice requires that it be dealt with totally. That when you enter the spiritual world, when you enter this olam haba, again, you can't have opposites existing. And if we enter the spiritual realm in olam haba to be close to God, then any deficiency that exists within you would therefore boot you right back out. You can't be there. Um, so any comments or anything at this point? Um, I'll continue a little bit more here. This principle contains another important concept. In the perfected community of the ultimate future, not everyone will attain the same level. The highest wisdom determined the lowest level upon which a person can exist and still attain perfection in an attachment of closeness to God. When an individual's deeds bring him up to the minimum level, he can then be a member of this perfected community and delight in God forever. One who does not attain this minimum level, on the other hand, is destined to be cast aside and completely I'm sorry, is destined to be cast aside completely and annihilated. Nevertheless, even within this community, different levels exist. The greater one's merit, the higher the level he will attain within this community. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll let you go, Bruce. No, no, I'm sorry. I, 
everything's slow on my computer. I can't. I couldn't raise my hand now. Then I couldn't. I was just going to point out how um, uh, you you kind of touched on it, but I think a lot of people might it might be useful to understand the. And you did touch on this, but I'm, I don't know if a lot of people get it. That when you talk of suffering and punishment, that can be in this life, not simply in the afterlife. And I, because I think a lot of people aren't. That that's kind of foreign, I believe, to the thoughts of many. That uh, we can receive our 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 suffering for our deeds in this life, and uh, we're blessed if we do. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention that because I think a lot of people may not grab that uh, and understand that that it's both now and later, or both now or later, or now and later. That uh, we receive our uh, our suffering, my history. Yeah, that's a very very. Yeah, I should have highlighted that a lot more. That in regards to reward, um, that all of the pleasure. The the saying is, all the pleasures in this world don't don't equal a moment of pleasure in the world to come. Meaning that whatever you compromise to get the pleasures in this world, think about what you're giving up in in exchange, and that. All the shame and harsh punishments of this world don't equal one singe in, in, in Gehenna. Meaning that think about um, the sufferings and the various um, deprivations that you may undergo to serve God in regards to what ultimately could be the consequence for not doing that now. Um, and as a result of that, knowing that there's ultimately a punishment, there's ultimately a place where we will be weighed and we will stand before God in judgment. Um, the best time to get it right and the, and the best time to act is now, <laughs> not later. Um, so the idea that BC brought up, again, is really important that you don't, we're not all going to be at the same level in the world to come. There are some people who are going to make it in by the skin of their teeth. They're going to squeak in barely. And um, because of that, um, they will not be at the same level. That they'll be they'll be weighed in the scales of justice and by God, and they'll be comp they'll be very lacking. But they'll have just enough good within them to make it in. And where that level, where that line in the sand, so to speak, is drawn, is ultimately in the hands of God, because that is He's ultimately the one who judges each person. Um, and this is really important that we're talking about individuals here in this case. We're not talking about nations and groups of people. This is individual, um, this is talking about the individual providence, the way that God deals with the individual. Um, and so he, there are different systems in place for peoples and nations as well, and they're judged differently. But this is the Ram calls talking about us as individuals, how God would deal with us as people. Um, so this is a really important concept coming up. Says God's plan was that man himself should be the complete master of his own good, both in general and in particular. In general, man can therefore not attain good unless he achieves it through his own effort. This is also true, however, of each element of this good which is only meted out according to the individual's precise deeds. Each individual's ultimate level is therefore the result of his own choice and attainment. With a postscript, I'll say that's true because God's taking every aspect of our lives into account, not just our actions, but the environment in which those actions were carried out. Noah existed in a wicked generation, so wicked that they were annihilated except for him and his family, and so the question is, is, is Noah this righteous man, or was he basically the best of a really horrible generation, and compared to other people, would he have been as righteous? But that's not, that doesn't matter. It's superfluous, because God judged him according to who he was in the time in which he lived, and not any differently, because Noah didn't live at the time of Abraham. He didn't live at the time of Moses. He lived when he lived in the environment he lived, and he was judged accordingly. And um, as a result of this, um, Noah was saved because of his of his actions and his deeds. Um, so it's not just the individual's deeds; it's every nuance of the environment in which they are done. And God takes everything into account: 
who we are as individuals, our propensity and our draw towards sin, our propensity and draw towards good, um, the circumstances that we exist in, the amount of God, of knowledge of God, of the, our access to not to um, knowledge of Hashem, all of these are taken into account um, as a result um, of this. So. Uh, and the good that we are given, the good and the merit of our deeds is based accordingly to what we were doing, what deed we did, and why we did it, our motivation, and um, how much, how difficult, how hard was it for us to achieve this action, this good action. No, in this BC, um, I know I'm answering for Bahanu. Um, if one suffers, is one doing evil? No, because he just said that he's going to get the wrong call. We get into a different idea of suffering as well and I'll skip ahead to give to answer BC's question um, that righteous individuals do suffer and not always because of their own actions but because of the generation in which they exist that God takes an individual who is righteous and willing to serve this function and gives them a small amount of suffering on behalf of that individual because therefore righteous has a great effect for good. Um, you can see that again lived out in the if the high priest was righteous and he lived according accordingly then the the amount of good that he could bring about for the nation of Israel was extraordinary and the amount of evil based upon his actions was was pretty extraordinary as well. Um, so a little bit of suffering on the behalf of the high priest in his service to Israel, on the, in service to Hashem, brought about a great deal of good that the whole nation didn't have to serve the function of the high priest. He did it. He did it on behalf of Israel, and he brought about a great deal of... Um, there's this idea that exists in this, in this level of divine providence that we're talking about that you can't always... Because God is ultimately the true judge and ultimately knows why events happen and ultimately orchestrates every event, you can't always say that A causes B and B causes C and C causes D. You can't always say that because you're not God. And so I, you know, I've said it before to others that you, you know, if you, you know, if you, your your great aunt Edna calls you because her car is not broken, and you say I'm too busy, and you don't help her, and you know tomorrow you go to start your car and it's dead, and you need like a thousand dollar repair. You can't necessarily say that you because you didn't help your great aunt Edna. Now my car is broken. You don't know that is in the hands of God. Should you go back and apologize to great aunt Edna? Maybe, but the point being that um, um, that not all actions in this world are directly a result of our sin. Sometimes things happen for the greater good, and, and some individuals have circumstances that exist simply because God wanted to use them in a particular way at a particular time. Um, so I'll continue on. Um, but God really does, we do have, ultimately we have the choices. We have many paths that we can take. We have many choices that we can make, and every choice is a consequence that leads to other choices and other um, actions. But ultimately, the choice is us. It's, it's our decision. God's not going to control us and make us do things. Now, that being said, we can be backed into a corner like a chess game. If God really is the grandmaster of this game, of this, of this game, of this chess game, and we are, we are the lowly, um, horrible chess player like I am, then he can he can make me, you know, the Grand Master can make you do anything. He can back you into a corner where you have no choice but to act a certain way. But it's still a choice. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. There are many reasons for suffering, and you cannot always necessarily say it's because somebody's evil or you did something wrong. It's, it's ultimately in God's hands. So I'll continue on a little bit more. Um, the members of the perfected community will therefore be divided into many levels, high and low, great and small. Each individual's level will not be the result of anything other than his own choice, and no one will therefore have any complaint against each other. I'm on page 105. Um, I'll read a little bit further and then I'll talk. This principle contains another important concept involving how one's deeds are judged 
to correctly ascertain their effects in determining his level in the perfected community. Every deed is judged as to whether or not it should benefit the individual's status in this community as well as to the extent in which it should do so. There will therefore be certain deeds which, according to the fair and precise judge, highest judgment, should not provide the individual any benefit whatsoever in this ultimate future, but should rather be rewarded in this world. An individual whose deeds are judged in this manner will receive the reward for his deeds in this world and then remain in a permanently inferior state among the lowest of the perfected community. In some respects, this is very much like the case of those who are completely rewarded in this world and then annihilated in the world to come. There is, however, a great difference between the two. In the case of this absolutely wicked person discussed earlier, the benefit of their deeds is completely used up through their reward in this world, and they therefore do not, have, do not experience eternal life at all. The class that we are now discussing, on the other hand, does attain eternity through their deeds, even though they may require great spiritual purification, they nevertheless retain a portion of this eternal existence. Because of the spiritual damage caused by their sins, however, the only good thing their deeds can attain for them is this minimal level mentioned earlier. A great portion of their merit, however, is rewarded in this world. Um... And so this is a really important idea that there are some really, really wicked people who do some really horrible things, and they still they still experience eternal eternal this eternal reward in the Lam Haba. They're not annihilated, but they exist at a very very diminished level in the world to come. Yeah, I, I'll come back to that. I'll let me finish my thought. We'll come back to. Six. Um, so these individuals caused great evil in this world and but I think about it like this and it's I don't I don't want to I don't want to offend anybody but somebody who does a holy wicked act which really hurts a lot of people let's say God forbid murder think about that individual when they were a baby you know you think about them like they were an infant at one time what happened? What transpired in that person's life to cause them to go from this infant to this murderer? What happened? We don't know what happened between that point and that point. What horrors, what suffering, what things they endured. Now, they made the choice. Ultimately, they made the choice. Nobody forced them to do anything. But when you look at some people's lives, and you think, oh my gosh, how did they not do something horrific earlier? How did they wait so why you know how you know it's you because this was an individual that had hopes and dreams and desires and wants and wishes and needs, and at some point something happened along the way to cause them to do this really evil deed to completely lose lose all contact with their with God and the spiritual self and to become absolutely at this level of an absolute animal. But that doesn't mean that they haven't they haven't done something along the way to sustain them enough to get them into the world to come. And not that they won't be judged and not that they won't suffer greatly and not that there won't be justice served in this world or maybe hopefully in this world and in the world to come. But that that individual will be dealt with. But that at the same time, the circumstances of this individual will also be taken into account because nobody exists in a vacuum, and no deed is done without the interconnectedness of being within a community and a family and a relationship with others. Um, so let me go back to visit ninety-seven, page ninety-seven. Um, let me see here if I can go back to 97 I'm trying to figure do you know what, uh, what um, paragraph that was in BC I'm trying to find it um, I'll continue talking a bit but, okay go ahead BC Yes, it's um, about the bottom third of the page. It's the end of a paragraph right beside the note that says, 
reward a distinction between the majority of one's deeds and the minority? It says, um, now the true main reward is in the world to come, as we noted. The everlasting recompense of the worthy individual is a bond of closeness with him forever, whereas the punishment is being thrust away from this true good and perishing. Now, um, my question is, that's talking about extinguishment, and I don't know if you saw earlier, um, I believe Bruce said uh, that the wicked suffer in the um, afterlife, not in, however, the Alam Haba. So the question is, do the wicked suffer some kind of anguish before being extinguished? Which would... Yes, I understand, Behano. They don't go to the Alam Haba. Uh, are we dealing with the concept of the wicked going to purgatory, not being perfected, and um, having gone through that suffering, being extinguished? Or are they simply judged not fit to continue and extinguished? The mic is back to you, Isabel. Sorry about this mic, that look. Um very, 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 very good question, and I honestly don't have a good answer at this point. I know what I, my inclination is to say, but I wouldn't have any sources to back it up, so that definitely would be um, something that I would have to do research on. Um, I know that the punishment of Gehenna has a function, has a purpose, and that is purification for the Alam Haba. That being said, um, does the attribute of justice need to be satisfied with suffering in the spiritual realm as well? Yeah, I know I have I have a personal inclination towards one way, um, but I don't have any I don't have any um, support to back it up. So I'll give you my email address. Um, but the but the person who is ultimately to end up in Alam Haba, and again, like I said, it's it's a really it's a really hard thing to think about because when you see these horrific evil deeds that truly hurt individuals and families and nations, you know, um, you but you really have to think about them, like because they were created by God. They and you know ultimately they made the choices that led them where they were. But what circumstances along the way diverted their choices, diverted their pathway, changed them? and cut them off and made them to the level of an animal. And so when God judges individuals, it's not always the actions that are being looked at. It's it's this whole picture that every nuance, every aspect of an individual and the circumstances in which they exist are judged accordingly by God because God is ultimately just, fair, long-suffering, patient, chesed, kind, good. And so... But there are real consequences, spiritual consequences that have everlasting effect on an individual that they may make it into the Alam Haba, but they're diminished to such an extent that they barely exist there. And that is, if you look at the ultimate punishment of the Torah, it's not the, it's not the, you know, you're going to be starved, you're going to eat your kids, you know, God's going to, you know, um, chase you to the farthest corners of the earth, you're going to fear for your lives. The ultimate curse of the Torah is that they forget who they are, so they can't even do any repentance. That's the ultimate curse, is, is, is complete disconnection and an ability to come back. And so annihilation is absolutely the worst punishment possible. And that being said, um, punishment from God has a purpose, and when inflict, when when whether you know, it's inflicted through the Alam Haba or it's inflicted through suffering in this world, it's not suffering for suffering's sake. It's it's to bring about a goal. It's to bring about an end to a me- you know it's a means to an end. It's not because God is wicked. I think a lot of the ideas of hell and, and these kind of things have these nuances of that God wants to see people punished because they had the, the audacity to, fought, to defy God's will at a certain point, so they're going to punish him for an eternity. Gonna, you know, it's not that. It's not about that. Punishment has a function. It has a role. The suffering in this world is not, it's not, it's not by accident. It's not by chance. It's not wasted energy. It literally serves an important function that the suffering of an individual is not overlooked by God because they're evil. It's 
it's, it serves a role. It brings about perfection in the individual and in, in the world as well. It brings us closer to the goal if one turns the circumstances of their, their life in a certain direction. All the suffering, all of the pain that they endured can bring about. It's not superfluous. It's not, it's not um, done by a cruel God wanting to see people squirm. It's, it's, we really believe, if you really believe God loves us as a creation, as a, as an individual, and that He wants only good for us, then, then everything in this world is orchestrated by God to bring us to that goal individually and as, and as a, and as a, um, as a people, as He, as, you know, mankind. Um, so let me see if I can get back to where we were. Are there any other questions or, or any comments? It's a very, 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 very good question, BC. Like I said, I'll have to get back to you. Um, so he was talking about this individual who barely, that they, they basically use up all their merit just to get into the Alam Haba, and when they get there, they have nothing left, no, nothing left over. And, um, so he's saying that because of the great sin, because of the the, uh, the um, overwhelming amount of deficiency that they caused in this world, these these may have been really good deeds. They may have been extraordinarily good deeds, but they were used up in their in basically in their bus fare to the world to come. And so when they get there, there's nothing. They don't have an account for anything. This is he says this is so even though the individual's deeds would normally result in their having a higher level in the perfected community. The fact that they are judged to be rewarded in this world prevents them from attaining that level. So, you know, just as suffering is, is, is imposed on certain individuals to bring about, um, to deal with the problem of sin or deficiency that exists within themselves, so some of the, 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 the I guess the age-old question is why do the wicked prosper? Why do some of the most evil people, you know, why do they seem to have these amazing circumstances that bring them money and power and influence when they're wholly wicked and that's when you come and you say well when they stand before God they're not going to have any you know they're not going to have God's not going to owe them anything they'll have used up all their merit in this world it'll have been gone and they'll have only punishment awaiting them when they stand before Hashem let me see what time it is here I'll read the next section and we'll be getting into <laughs> section 3 for next time According to everything discussed in this section, we can understand why the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. In addition, we see how spiritual punishments are part of the preparation for the ultimate true reward. The good that the righteous attain in this world, however, involves a completely different concept, and this will be discussed presently. Everything that we have discussed in this chapter deals with the second aspect discussed in the chapter's beginning, namely the preparation of humanity as a whole for the future world. That which involves individuals, however, entails a completely different approach, and this will be the subject of the next chapter. So he's talking, he was talking general, general, generalities about, you know, this is the, um, these are the general schemes that God has set up, the general systems and mechanisms that God has sent set up in our world to deal with reward and punishment, good and evil, sin and deficiency and light and good. Now, he's going to say, how does God, how does God tweak this in the individual's life? How does God orchestrate an individual's circumstances to bring about these realities? And um, there's a system, just like there's systems in place for um, systems and rules of a game that we use the analogy of chess. There are rules of chess. There are rules for each each player. There are certain things that can be done. There are certain things that can't be done. Now, that analogy is limited in the fact that God created everything and can transcend the rules of nature and the laws of even the own spiritual laws himself and intercede at any particular time because he's God and he created the rules. Um, and so... The, the idea of providence is that this is how God functions on the individual and nation level and how, um, I guess to say, some predictability I, um, in regards to we have, we have predictability to some, at some level 
in regards to our actions and consequences. God's revealed what's good and proper, what we should avoid, um, how we should interact, who um, the true essence upon which the world is built, meaning the foundations of the world are based on certain principles of goodness and fairness and judgment and reward, and um, how we're to relate to these concepts has been given to us. And so there's predictability to some extent that when we do one thing that the consequence will be, you know, another. Just like there are rules and systems in place in the natural world, like gravity and um, all these different realities of our physical world, the same is true in the spiritual realm as well. Um, and we as individuals um, ha sit in a really powerful position that um, God is ultimately reevaluating the game at every stage based upon the choices we made, based upon the choices we could make, and orchestrating our lives in such a way that he'll bring us to an ultimate purpose if we so choose to get there. <laughs> Um, so, are there any questions or comments and any um, input or anything? It will be starting in the idea of individual um, providence next week. Yeah, this, if you want a really good companion book to read to this ROM call study, um, if you're looking for um, some other reading material. Inner space is really, there are concepts that might be hard for people to deal with, but the really amazing thing about inner space is Arya Kaplan takes a lot of the concepts that are introduced in this book and he expands upon them in, in inner space and he explains them in different ways and uses analogies that are really amazing. Um, I find it as a as I've, as I've been rereading this book, I've been finding myself turning to inner space a lot to um, gain a little more insight and in ways to explain concepts and ideas. Um, yeah, Thirteen Petaled Rose is another amazing book. Um, absolutely amazing book. Adin Steinsaltz is a very good author. He has an amazing gift to explain things. Um, like Arya Kaplan. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you everyone for coming. I know that I'll forewarn you <laughs> that some of the sections, if you haven't read ahead yet, there are going to be, there could be things that, you know, again, like the idea of purgatory and other concepts that are coming up. This isn't to make you believe them, but to understand that these concepts are taught within Judaism, that there is a, there is a real understanding and a real basis for these concepts these ideas of purgatory and other concepts that might come up later in the book and that you're not you know it's just because they're here it's not trying to get you to believe that this is this is the way to believe that this is a concept and understanding that exists and by studying it doesn't mean you're going to become a flaming heretic and suddenly change everything you believe it means that you're opening your mind to understand um, these concepts and how they are dealt with and it's a different way of looking at <laughs> it's a different way of looking at these deep spiritual concepts and one of the other things I wanted to say is um, just like in, in our world we have systems of like mathematics you don't our world can be explained through mathematics through principles through understanding through laws the same is true regarding the spiritual realm that God did reveal his essence he, we have this scripture and what Judaism, a lot of people and amazing minds in Judaism have done is they've taken these various concepts and ideas which appear at different points in scripture and map them out. <laughs> they map them out in an understandable way that, you know, reading about one idea in, 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 you know, in Genesis and then in Exodus and Isaiah and the Psalms and these concepts come up again and again. What a lot of the authors have done, and, are, and Ram Khal is among them, is he's taken these concepts which appear at different places in scripture and put them into a, a system to understand them. And so a lot of the concepts that we're getting into have been mapped out to understand them and to basically to make sense of some of these ideas that we 
a lot of us can't think in these in, in this you know scattered idea that we we like systems we like to see information organized we like to see concepts described consistently and so a lot of these like the book that I'm talking about inner space is teaching you systems of organizing information from scripture and applying it in different ways and um, and it's important to, once you do that to you know um, be able to take and take then learn the basic concepts and apply them at an even deeper level okay if we come to contact with those who are absolutely wicked as a result of their deeds is it possible for us to be affected by the fallout of their punishments in this world yeah Jeremiah is a great example he seemed to be a pretty righteous individual in a really horrible circumstances and he really suffered he was um, you know read the book of Lamentations it's not a very nice thing to read he suffered incredibly not because he was an evil individual but because of the um, circumstances in which he lived and as a result of that um, the um, people do suffer a great deal um, because there's a really important concept that you know in the Ram call talks about it later in the book that there is this connectivity that we all share there is a connectivity now at different levels people are connected like Israel is at this very high connectivity God bound them together as one when they made a vow to God to do and to to, to do these things and they were bound together in a vow and they they were all placed in the same boat and as a result of this there is this idea of communal reward and communal suffering um, again I use I go back to it all the time the analogy of the man who's drilling the hole underneath his own seat he he affects everybody in the boat the the truth is we are we are connected humanity is connected ultimately as a whole because our source comes from God comes from Adam comes from um, we are connected and, and some of us are more connected than others <laughs> um, it depends because there's also associations um, why do I say it that light can affect darkness and I, I don't want to comment on your specific situation but um, you look at the prophets and and again association with anything that is deficient is really dangerous because um, unless you're a highly perfected individual then you know you're you have you're really putting your it's like um it's like an alcoholic going into a bar I don't know many alcoholics that could it'd be very dangerous maybe there are some that exist that can go back and do that but not many could and so the example um, is that that unfortunately for most people that association would be very damaging and um, the prophets um, were example of these really highly perfected individuals who did associate themselves with evil and um, and they were required to do so by the very nature of the calling but most of us um, and even the prophets themselves suffered as a result of this there are times where they stumbled and fell so most of us when we associate and we join ourselves with evil individuals then it can do great spiritual damage and if you look in the Torah that these evil individuals were to be um, dealt with pretty quickly and God gave various mechanisms like you have pain as a warning sign and maybe there's a disease process going on or you should be you know doing things differently um, there were spiritual warning signs that God gave the nation of Israel too so they wouldn't be caught unaware of the sin that was transpiring in their own midst You're thinking of the concept in Christianity which teaches an upright wife can save her husband. Um, it's a really difficult. It's a it's a it's a difficult concept in the idea of um, salvation and what does that mean? <laughs> that there are righteous individuals do affect the people around them. Um, and they do have the ability to bring in light and goodness um, but there is absolutely in Judaism you know they, if your husband is wicked and he's rebellious and he is doing evil things then the question comes to bear is like you are allowed a divorce you are you are actually the question is 
are you required to get one? Do you stay or do you not stay? So that's dealt with in different parts of Jewish thought. Um, when you have a rebellious, it's, and the Torah says if it's your own brother, if it's your own child, you are to deal with that individual because any sin spreads, deficiency cr- encroaches in, and it's like, you know, it's like throwing a match in, in a dry forest. It's probably going to light a forest fire. So dealing with things is really important and not allowing them to be within your own midst is another important concept that the Torah brings out. Um, so, but it's hard to, yeah, go ahead and someone else pick up the mic. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. in my opinion, just an observation, I, I, we, we've kind of gotten to that point, I think, where if, if you haven't been reading the book or not reading the book, you're going to find yourself getting perhaps more and more confused and behind. Uh, I would just, just my own opinion, I would suggest, uh, particularly since the book is about to enter into a very, very important area. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but but it's about to get to a, to a point that uh, I suspect will engender a significant amount of discussion and questions and comments and opinions. And um, so maybe during this next week, it would be good to perhaps make a special effort to try to catch up if you haven't uh, read up to this point. Because I, I really think, this is my observation again, and I commented in PM about this, that we're beginning to see a slight drop in the in the people who are participating and all, and I really think it's because people are kind of getting left behind, so to speak, for lack of a better word. They're they're kind of, they're they're back behind. They they haven't read the book. They haven't. They may even have the book. And I'm not trying to you know smack anybody on the wrist or anything, but I, I just a suggestion. It would really be good for people to over the next week try to catch up. Uh, to get to the point that we're now at, because it's about to enter into what, for everyone, will probably be one of the most, uh, what's a good word, uh, interesting <laughs> uh, areas of the book. And, uh, again, I don't want to give it away, but uh, just that's just my observation. Try to catch up. Uh, if you haven't, if you're not where we are now at the book, please uh, try to make an effort to get there by next week. Mike is free. Uh, just a mic check. Is the volume okay here? Check, check. Can you hear me? Low. Yeah, I'm, I'm cranked up too. I don't know why it's just so low. Um, I'm going to talk a little louder. Stick the microphone inside my larynx here. Um, sounds creaky. Um, the way I'm trying to be is a bit quiet. Bruce um, brought a point up I want to mention and reiterate. Uh, there are different parts of the, of the book where it seems that uh, the author says, okay, uh, without saying this, he seems to almost go like, okay, we've covered these concepts, now I'm going to bring you to uh, uh, what these concepts mean, uh, what they formulate, what they, they mean, and, he, and he takes it to another another level, another level. Uh, all these things we've learned so far well, the basis for something important. And, and like Bruce said, yeah, we're, we're going to hit a section coming up now where we start getting into some very cool stuff. Some very cool stuff on the nature of sin and atonement. And uh, like as well as saying, the connectivity between human beings and the level of the soul and, and how sin and atonement, how we're connected, how righteous people can help the 
I don't know if the question was technically addressed or not, and I think probably we'll get into it in the next section in um, individual provenance, so it's okay. I mean, I am substantially ahead of the class, so it's hard sometimes to ask questions which are um, on topic. Um, okay. <laughs> well, the thing is that... Um, you know, there are different reasons for suffering, and I don't remember, honestly, how I phrased the question in the first place. And um, if the suffering in this world is intended to perfect us or help us to make better choices so that we are um, affecting tikkun, so that we are uh, developing our neshama and moving toward the light, how should we deal with that suffering? Should we have a positive attitude? Should we look at all suffering as being that? Um, should we even be making judgment about that? And I won't ask any more questions. I think you understand. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Isabel address the question, but I'm going to make one kind of a semi-humorous answer. Uh, have you ever seen the movie Ush Pazin? Have you ever seen the movie Ush Pazin? Oh, you should find that at your local movie store and get it. It's it's awesome. It's an incredible movie um, set in Jerusalem. The story of a couple and it's a code. It's a subtitle in English. It's incredible what goes on. Well, there's this one scene. Um, well, go to a friend's house and bring it over there. It's worth it, believe me. <laughs> um, okay, so there's this one scene where the man who's a, he's a teacher, he's a rabbi and you know religious person, married and, and uh, life's, life everything's been going wrong so he's on the porch with his friend and his friend goes up to him his name is, the man's name is Moshe and his friend goes up to him and says Moshe how's it going and he looks at his friend and he goes terrible Baruch Hashem which is just terrible bless God thank God <laughs> so to answer your question <laughs> there you go right terrible thank God because <laughs> it's all from God so anyhow I, I, it's funny but it's true now, I wish I wish I could really be that way, but uh, I know I'll put the question back up for Isabel or anybody else. Um, you know, how do we react when things are not going well? Well, but even the New Testament says what we should rejoice and tribulate. What Romans five, Romans chapter five, right? Go look at Romans five. I'm doing it off the top of my head. Around verse three, re rejoice in tribulation, and and other places in the New Testament, and the Talmud, and the Midrashim all say the same thing. It's all from God. Whatever it is, rejoice. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and, and rejoice in it, even if it stinks. Um, well, let's see. There's two pillars upon which we should base our service to God, and that's um, trust and faith. And the important thing is that when certain in circumstances happen in our life, to have the trust that Hashem is ultimately in control. The only thing that we can modify is our response to our circumstances, how we respond to individuals and um, and circumstances as they as they um, happen. 
that we ultimately can't control them, but we can affect them in that we can respond to them in, in, in a proper way or an improper way. And um, that being said, when one is going through trials and tribulations or physical suffering, um, we always are required to, to become introspective, to contemplate why are these circumstances happening, to delve into the realm of our own actions and how we are relating to God, relating to ourselves, relating to individuals, how we are managing our life, and if we're acting properly. Um, to assume automatically that all suffering is done be is comes about or circumstances that may be unpleasant come about as a result of some sin in our life is not always the case. Um, the same is true about rewards. There's some people that are really they're really nasty people that have the all these advantages simply because they were born to rich parents. And there are others and so the parents may be the ones and then the wrong call uses no, this is the wrong call I'm trying to I've read so many books. But the parents may be the one who merited the money and not the child, but the child gets the benefit of the money simply because of the circumstances of his birth. Not that God didn't orchestrate that either. But there's a, 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 an enjoyment of the of this material blessing simply through the circumstances. Um, no, I mean, but but when Job was insistent that you know I did, I've, I he you look how many times Job says I've I've I'm not the one to blame. I'm you know he has uh, a duty. We all have a duty and obligation to examine our own deeds and say sometimes there isn't an answer. There is not an answer, and you'll never know because sometimes some of the circumstances seemingly have no connectivity to this world and no no ability to comprehend the co the, the action that may have caused such such a circumstance to come about. Um, but that being said, there is a real connection between sin and and, and physical suffering and disease, um, but that's not always it's not always a cause and effect as well. So you can't assume just because these circumstances are occurring in your life, it's because you're sinful. But you can't assume either that these circumstances are occurring be, and, um, without regard to what you've done. Um, and that's where you really, yeah, you really need to look and, and say, you know, I need an answer, Hashem, you know, that it's not like he's going to, you know, I guess it's happened a few times where the, you know, the visible hand will tell you yes or no, yes, it's because of A, B, C, or D. We have an intellect, we have the capacity to examine our deeds, to really, if we choose to, connect to Hashem in a way through our actions and through meditation and through prayer, that we, we gain certain insight and clarity. That's the level of the Ruach. The Ruach, when you really seek God, that Ruach, the higher level of our soul, is, and um, the Ruach HaKodesh is that one that, that causes that inspiration, that insight, that, 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 you know, oh, I see it, or, or this inclination to go a certain way, um, to think a certain way, may be influenced by these higher realms of our spiritual self. Um, so we have a, um, so we do have a duty and an obligation if we, once we've done those steps and these circumstances still exist, to make choices based on our understanding of who God is and the principles that are, uh, that are that govern the world. And so, um, not everything that we have to make choices about is there is not 100% clarity on everything. Not every choice falls into that black, you know, right or wrong, black or white category. Sometimes there's these all these shades of gray, and you really have to rely upon your knowledge of who you are, the circumstances that you've been placed in, um, your role in the world, and your knowledge and understanding of God at that point, that moment, to make the right, to make the choice, um, and um, through our, that's why study and meditation and prayer is so important because it gives us enlightenment. Literally, it brings a greater amount of God's light into our world. It gives us more clarity regarding these issues, and you know. And sometimes I can't even say that there is a right choice. I mean, there is always a right or wrong. But sometimes the choice you make is, I don't know, it's kind of like the chess player that's been backed into the corner. It may not necessarily be the choice that they would choose to make, but there's no other choice to make. And so um, 
it's not always an easy position to find ourselves in. I mean, I know I'm speaking very vague, but yeah, and that's what that's ultimately it, that ultimately comes about because through suffering, people can can connect at a higher level. It forces you to to connect at a higher level. The mundane things can become overwhelming and over and 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 can um, completely drown you. So you have to transcend your circumstances to connect to the God at a at any level you can. And um, and it's not always easy. And there's a that's I mean I love I love um, there's a a rabbi called Rabbi um, Nachman, and he was from the town of Breslov, and he wrote a lot about suffering and doing it with joy, like the um, like the example from the movie of Fuzin, that, you know, it's horrible, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> it is, because, you know, this is a circumstance, this set of, of challenges that I now face are given to me by God. But that being said, there is the belief that God's given you every tool and everything you need to overcome them. He's not going to, that, that these, um, that God will not abandon you and leave you stranded without the tools necessary, the resources available, or the understanding that this you have everything you need to succeed at this particular time in your life if you choose to utilize the resources that are within your life. So let's make it free.